Okay, hi everyone. Let's start today. Um, so today I'm going to um, talk about the content of the three exercises that appear in the exercise sheet this week. So the first one has to do with the non-equilibrium free energy. Um, then the second one we'll see um, some thermal operations using the machine or the catalyst, um, and how and how basically we can restrict the class of operations using the um, uh, negativity of the free energy difference. And finally, we'll have one uh, fun exercise on the work cost of quantum computing. Uh, so first, let me uh, talk about the free energy. So the non-equilibrium free energy, as we've seen it in a course, is the free energy of the system, which has the state rho, but it also has um, access to the environment. Uh, what is this sound, I wonder? Okay. Okay, I guess I shouldn't touch the, the cable. Okay, so the free energy is KT, uh, relative entropy of the state row relative to the state, uh, the thermal state tau, minus kt log z. Okay, uh, where the relative entropy is the usual one, which is derived from for Norman entropy formulation, so it's trace of rho log rho minus rho log tau, where tau is the thermal state. Okay, so the first question is, if we look at this free energy, uh, for which state of the system rho it, uh, it is equal to the usual definition of the free energy of a state? So say that you have a state um, rho, and then how would you define the uh, entropy of this state? So uh, the answer is, if we take rho equal to tau, so basically uh, the state rho is in equilibrium with the thermal environment, then basically, of course, the relative entropy would be zero. And our f of rho, which is tau, would be just this minus kt log z. OK. Uh, good. Uh, so basically, if you just take um, an environment with the Hamiltonian h, sorry, the system with the Hamiltonian h, then the usual free energy, um, like the equilibrium version of the free energy would be written as minus kt log z. Okay, uh, the next thing is, so if, we, if, you, if you take in a thermodynamics course or a statistical physics course, then maybe you remember the so-called Helmholtz uh, free energy. So the Helmholtz free energy is, was defined as F equals U minus TS, where U is the internal energy of the system, T the temperature, S is the entropy. So uh, now actually massaging this equation for the free energy, we can show that we will indeed, uh, we will indeed get something similar to the Helmholtz free energy. So kind of this free energy defined in this sense is um, the, same, the same measure as the one from statistical physics or classical thermodynamics, which is the Helmholtz free energy. So to do so, I'll just write out the uh, relative entropy here explicitly. So we have kt trace rho log rho uh, minus kt trace 
row log tau uh, minus kt log z. And tau is the thermal state, which means I can write tau as e to the power minus beta h um, over z. Okay, I'll just substitute it in here. Uh, so what I get is also let us note that uh, this expression here, uh, trace rho log rho, it's minus entropy of the state rho. So the first term would be just minus kt, the entropy of rho. Uh, the second would be kt trace rho um, logarithm of e to the power minus beta h over z. Uh, and then we have minus kt log z. Okay, and now we just massage the middle term in this expression. And what we get is, uh, from opening up the logarithm, we'll get kt trace um, rho minus beta h uh, plus kt uh, log z, because here we'll just have trace of rho log z, and trace of rho is 1, because rho is a density matrix. And here we have minus kt log z, just from the previous step. Okay, and here what we will get is we take um, the beta out. Okay, okay, that's better. Uh, we take the beta out, and beta is 1 over kt, so this one goes away, and plus uh, minus minus gives us plus, so basically what we get is trace of rho h minus uh, kt s of rho. Um, so indeed, we get the uh, average energy of the system minus kt entropy of the system which is yeah up to this factor k uh, the Helmholtz free energy okay Um, now a few more uh, properties of the of the free energy. Maybe I just use the corner to write that. So, in this equation of, for the free energy, uh, one thing that you can prove, you'll be asked to prove, is to to show that uh, K T S of rho relative to tau is always uh, non-negative. Um, and this you can do, maybe you already did it in quantum information theory course, but you can also do it by uh, using the fact that if you take uh, a function f of x, y, which is x log x over y, then it has a property that f of x1 plus x2, y1 plus y2 uh, is less or equal than f of x1, x, uh, y1 plus f of x2, y2. So it's just a hint. Uh, okay, and 
The last thing is if we take, a, what happens if we take a composite system? How can we rewrite the free energy uh, for the composite system, of, which consists of two non-interacting subsystems? So suppose I have a composite system described by the Hilbert space HAB, HA tensor product HB. It has a Hamiltonian HAB, which is non-interacting, which means that it can be written in the form HA tensor product identity on B plus identity on A tensor product HB. And uh, we want to write the free energy of a state on such system. And for, for such type of the systems where we have two subsystems which are not interacting, we know that the thermal state can be just written as the tensor product of the corresponding thermal states on two subsystems. Uh, and so basically, in this case, uh, the free energy would be KT S of rho AB relative to tau A tensor product tau B uh, minus KT log ZAB. And ZAB can also be written as just the product of ZA and ZB. Uh, because of this non-interacting property. Uh, okay, and basically, if you massage this equation a bit, and uh, then what you would get in the end is uh, that you can actually split this expression for free energy for this um, bipartite system in such a way that the first term would contain the information about the um, correlations between these two systems. Then the second term would be just the free energy of the first system, and the third term would be the free energy of the second system. Uh, so you have to uh, formally prove this expression in the in the exercise sheet, but this is very easy if if you just write out. Uh, if you know how to write out the mutual information, which is just the S of rho A plus S of rho B minus S of rho AB, and then uh, write these three energies explicitly. But the most important kind of takeaway from this uh, from this property is that for the bipartite non-interacting um, system. Uh, we can write out the free energy neatly as the sum of these three terms. And we know in which term uh, like the correlations between these two systems are hidden. Okay. Uh, so this was all in the free energy. Uh, now, more interesting consideration. So we'll go back to our thermal operations. And we'll consider a very particular scenario using catalyst. And then we'll see uh, like two, um, two different ways to kind of use the catalyst. So, and we'll talk about again about this uh, free energy, but we'll talk about the whole class of free energies. So, First, the setup. So which setup are we using? So uh, we have the following. Basically, uh, we have a machine, like, like our thermal uh, construction that we're using. I'll just draw it as a machine. It's funnier that way. And it has two things. So first, it has uh, sigma m. Which, is, which can be seen as a part of the state of the machine, uh, but also can be seen as a catalyst of the, of the interaction. So, uh, and then we also have a work bit in this machine. 
So say we start in the excited state and uh, the energy gap of the work bit, we label it as delta. This is V system. Okay, and so we want to use this machine to, uh, <coughs> to somehow transform the state of our system A and with the Hamiltonian HA, and this is the target system. Uh, again, the class of, uh, class of tra transitions that we consider is only those which uh, preserve energy. So we have some energy preserving transformation. And what we end up with is like the same thing. So here we have sigma m, here we have our work bit, which is now in the ground state. And we have our system in the state row A prime. So uh, basically one type of transformations that we can, this is one type of transformations that we can consider, which is Let's say for now, forget about the work bit. Uh, it's when I take row A, add the state sigma M, and I transform it into row A prime sigma M. So basically in this case, the, the state of the catalyst, state of the machine sigma M is, um, is not touched. So it indeed acts like as a catalyst, the same, the same, the same way that we use the catalyst and the chemical reactions. Uh, the second, the second way to use this setup is uh, to start from the same tensor state. Now I'll also write it with the work bits, or I mean, okay, here we don't. We also, for now, can cannot think about it. I don't have to think about it. So uh, I have this, but in the end of my transformation, the states of the of the target system and the machine are um, are entangled. Basically, they so they can be some correlations. Okay, this is two. And uh, the state is such that trace of this is, we label as Roy prime, but the trace, if we trace out the, the target system A, then we should get the, uh, the state of the catalyst. So basically, uh, which kind of operation we're carrying out here. So we allow transitions between two states, um, between uh, energy preserving transformations. Uh, and also we have this in the second, uh, in the second type of our transformation, what we do in the end, we, um, we trace out, uh, we trace out the, we kind of separate these two systems. This is the target system and the machine, and the machine is still not affected because as soon as we separate it from, as soon as we trace out the target system, uh, it's still back to its own catalyst state, so we can use it again. Uh, okay, so a bit uh, about the first setup, where we just um, tensor product with a catalyst, and then we arrive to the state, and the catalyst is completely unscathed and still in the, um, in the tensor product. Okay, uh, so we will not show it here, but I give a, I give a reference to the paper which shows it in the, in the exercise sheet. So here, uh, 
the possibility of straight transitions in such a way is given by the whole family of uh, alpha free energies. So basically, delta F alpha, which is F alpha of rho A prime minus F alpha of rho A uh, should be less or equal than zero for all alpha bigger or equal than zero. And F alpha of rho, rho A, you already saw them before. This is just KT S alpha rho A relative to tau A minus KT log Z alpha. Ah, I, of course, I forgot to mention that this is all in the in some bath at temperature T. So everything is connected to this bath. Uh, and we can always take the thermal states for free. Uh, and this is our this is just the usual um, Rennie entropy for the alpha. Okay, so for example, for alpha equal one, we should get our usual um, non-equilibrium free energy that we discussed before. So one of rho A would be the average energy for rho A minus KT S of rho A. This is the same calculation that we did before because for alpha equal one, S1 is just the usual von Neumann relative entropy. Okay, uh, this was the first scenario. So here um, you see that the condition is given by this whole family of alpha alpha free energies. However, if we take the second um, the second transition, so the, here uh, this class of transformations allows for for uh, for the state transition. Only uh, for only if we take the alpha equals one. So here we need uh, to check whether um, state transition is allowed or not. We need to check the delta F one, basically. So this is the condition. Uh, okay, so why why are we looking at these conditions and why, why is it sometimes more useful to look at this class of uh, transitions than to the first class of transitions? So one, one of the reasons is because uh, the first class of transitions which, which keeps um, these two systems separate and in tensor product is very difficult to achieve. And in the end, usually uh, when you carry out a transformation on two systems, you anyway uh, need to allow to, for some correlations between them. Uh, however, what is what this class also of transitions also achieves is uh, it can increase efficiency of the operations that are carried out. So, uh, to, to show that, um, 
you will look at the at the following transition in the in the exercise sheet and uh, if you calculate the work costs for 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 um, achieving that state of the system row a prime using the first transition and the second transition you would find that using the second class would be would be cheaper in terms of the work cost so basically let me just outline the argument yeah okay so so the argument is so let me sketch it so Now we will also include the, the work qubit in our considerations because we want to calculate the work cost. Uh, and so suppose that uh, we want to, let me see. Yes, so we have we have a, a machine and the commentary of the machine is zero and uh, it has the states zero and one so we assume that this machine or the catalyst is a qubit uh, and we label the the ground in the excited states of of the system uh, of the work system as ground and excited. So the kind of the power of this example is that you can already see the uh, the decrease in a in a work cost already in a case when you just consider that the machine or the catalyst is one qubit. And basically, we're looking at the at the situation where the our target system is initially in a thermal state and we start with the tensor state thermal state on the target system um, state sigma of the machine and excited state of the uh, work bit work qubit and by the end of transformation we arrive to row a m prime some correlated states on the system A and the, and the machine and the ground state on the work system. Okay, uh, then basically, so, yes, then we will look at the state uh, of the let me so first say state of the catalyst sigma m is three tenths of on, uh, zero zero of the machine plus seven tenth one one and we'll consider rho a m a uh, prime, uh, which is one tenth of say zero 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 plus four tenth zero one zero one plus two tenth uh, one zero one zero plus three tenths um, one, 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 one. Uh, so first looking at the state, you already see that it satisfies the, the important restriction that we trace out the system A. So it's AM, 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 and AM. 
we'll get back our initial state of the catalyst. Uh, yes, that's basically one, uh, one restriction that this final state has to satisfy. Uh, and then the idea is that, so here you can find rho a prime by just tracing, tracing out. And then you would, uh, you would compare the work cost of two processes. So one process is um, this one where we just achieved this uh, correlated state between the system A and the machine M. And the second process where uh, we keep the state of the machine uh, decoupled from the from the state of the system. And we will try to achieve the same state of the system. So, sigma m. Uh, so you can calculate the work cost of these two processes. And in the end, what you will find out is that the, the work cost of this process is less than here. Okay, um, I think I'll make a break now so we can continue with the, with the different topic in the second part. Oh, please, you have any questions, oh, ask. So we'll continue in, let's say, um, 35, no, even like, uh, let's say 40 past. So now we're gonna do a fun exercise on the work cost of processes on a quantum computer. So we're gonna take a set of very basic assumptions about our quantum computer. So first, uh, suppose that we have a quantum computer of n qubits. Each qubit um, is described by the trivial Hamiltonian uh, h equals zero. Um, and also, we assume that we can perform the standard unitary gates with no cost. However, whenever, for example, we want to erase the qubit um, to, to the ground state, we need to pay a price. And, uh, and so we have two operations. So uh, the first operation we'll call reset qubit to zero, so is that zero, on the kth qubit. And what it does if we, is resets no matter what state the qubit is in, um, the uh, at the work cost of, so let's say some row on the kth qubit, um, at the work cost of kt log two, uh, it resets it to the ground state. Uh, and where T is the temperature of the setting. And the second is kind of the opposite operation in a sense, it extracts work. So we do, we can also extract work using the Keith qubit. Um, so if the Keith qubit is in the state zero, then, uh, so here we kind of, it's the cost, the work cost. Here instead we get KT ln two, uh, and we put it into the maximum limit state. So. So these are two operations that are available to us. And now uh, we're just gonna play a simple game of uh, calculating the work costs of different processes. So suppose that the, fir the first one is very easy. Suppose that um, the register, so this k qubits are in a maximum limit state. So I have 
I have n qubits. It's going to be two to the power n. Uh, and I want to erase it to uh, all zeros. Uh, so what is the cost of this process? Sorry? Yes, exactly. Basically, yeah, it's it's a very basic procedure. Uh, so each each qubit is in a maximum limit state, so we just need to apply the reset zero operation to each qubit, and each operation costs kt ln two. Okay, uh, a bit more complicated scenario. So say I have the so-called GHZ state on three qubits. So, which is described as zero 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 plus one 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 uh, or square root of two, and what I want to do is I want to reset uh, the first qubit to zero. So zero and first qubit, and uh, I want to keep the reduced state of the second and the third qubit unchanged. So then the second and the third qubit would be in a state 0, 0, 0, 0 plus 1, 1, 1, 1 over 2. Okay, and here I guess I need to write it as a density matrix since I started writing it. So these are qubits 2 and 3, and this is a state on the qubits 1, 2, 3. Uh, so first, uh, what would be the sequence of the operations that you would propose to apply to this initial state uh, to get that final state? Uh, you can use any unitary gates um, on the qubits, and also you can use these two operations. So this will require several steps. Any ideas? <laughs> no worries. <laughs> but I mean, if you have any idea what to do, for example, so in, in total, we will need, uh, there, there is an example with four steps. I mean, there are several ways to do this. So. Uh, no, it's only applied to uh, one qubit. Yes, yes, exactly. So yeah, you, you have a very right, right idea that first we need to kind of decouple some qubits, so to say. Um, and so for example, the first thing that we can do is we can apply a C naught gate on a qubit two and three. And what we will get is we will get just the state zero on a qubit three. And this is this operation is for free. Per our assumptions. Uh, okay, and then we we can. Uh, yeah, we can extract um, extract work from the first two qubits. 
basically. Or we can apply yeah, a C node again, and then we get our, yeah, just zero plus one. Maybe that's easier to see. A zero and zero. And then we apply this extract work to the first qubit and to the second qubit. And what we get is the maximally mixed state on the first uh, qubit, maximally mixed state on the second qubit, and the zero state on the third qubit. And this operation we extract uh, 2kt log 2 work. Uh, we can directly, I mean, uh, as soon as we have the state separated, we can apply directly. But you're right. In, in, in any sense, because this is a good comment, because uh, actually this extract work would work for any um, any pure initial state of the system, because like you can just rotate um, the, the system to be in that state. Uh, in, the same way, in the same vein of thought, actually, the reset zero would work for any final pure state of the system, because we can also, in the end, just add the rotation at no cost. OK, so we get that. Uh, and now we reset the first qubit to 0. So let me maybe label 1, 2, 3, uh, then 4. Uh, we reset the first qubit to 0, which we actually want to do. Uh, so it's in a state 0. Uh, the second qubit is in a state which is maximally mixed, and the third qubit is in state zero. And for this, we pay kt log two. Uh, and finally, to get to the final state, which operation do we have to apply? Yes. So we, if we apply the C naught gate um, between two, these two systems controlled on the second system, we'll get to that state. So we'll get zero on the first system and that state on the second. Okay, and then the total cost of the process would be that we extract kt ln2 work. So there are other ways to do this, but they would anyway require yeah, some number of these operations and also c naughts. Okay. Uh, And basically, the whole exercise is a bunch of such um, problems where you get the initial state, you get the final state, and then you need to figure out how to get from the initial state to the final state using these simple operations and calculate the work cost. Um, yeah, the processes that you would have to uh, come up with they don't necessarily need to be optimal, but in fact, for example, this process I described just there uh, is optimal for such state transition. So for example, another problem from the same exercise is, let's take, uh, three qubits, in a state one third zero 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 it's gonna be mixed state uh plus two thirds one 
Uh, and we need we want to transform it to the state which has uh, the first qubit will be in zero. And the last two uh, would be, so basically for the last two, we need to not change their reduced state. The same as in previous one. So one, two, three. Okay, so one, two, three. Okay. Uh, yeah, proposals? So you have at your disposal the unitary gates, but take your C naught, any rotation. Uh, on a single qubit, uh, reset to zero uh, operation and extract work operation. Yes, exactly. So if you apply a C naught between the second and uh, because the first and the second qubit, so. And actually you just get to that state without any work cost. So the work cost is zero. Okay, um, so this is basically the gist of this exercise. There are a couple more um, points to it. So uh, yeah, I think this is, everything I wanted to uh, talk about in this exercise class. Please ask me questions if you have any. Um, if not, yeah, have a great week and see you next week.